great joy to be with you. I was thinking in all the festivities of today, I'm going to kind of strike the theme of warfare in, in, a, in a personal way, if I can get to it by three in the afternoon, but I'm, I'm just kidding. But I thought of the Word of God uh, as we open in the mission chapels. We sing the song, and I'm almost tempted to have you sing it with me, the B-I-B-L-E. Uh, you all know it, don't you? The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. God's Word shall never fail, never fail, never fail. God's Word shall never fail, no, no, no. By the way, that you were kind of weak on the end there. Um, let's try that. God's word shall never fail, never fail, never fail. God's word shall never fail. No, no, no. Thank you. How do you deal with people who don't believe the Bible and seemingly are atheistic in their attitude? And when I think of the B-I-B-L-E, we've taken a little slogan, a little acrostic, and we, you've heard it, I'm sure, basic instructions before <laughs> leaving earth. B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. It's the truth, isn't it? Aren't you glad God, listen, God gave us a manual to go with the product. I'm sure you bought a microwave or a fridge or I have a car out there with a big manual in it. Hopefully I don't have to look at it often. <laughs> but many times we'll get an appliance and we'll plug it in and when the smoke starts coming up out of the back, somebody says, hey, how's this thing supposed to work? Let's get the manual. And so most of us have the philosophy, if I'm not mistaken, that when all else fails, read the directions. And we can live that way. Aren't you glad God gave us a manual to go with the product? And we need to really devour this manual so that we can honor and glorify God. And frankly, this, this is the bottom line, whether you're at a rescue mission or at a local church or down at the drugstore, doesn't make much difference. God, this one size fits all, if you will. And so I just wanted to express that today. And also, in light of the theme of this day, this book is really a manual of warfare. I was reminded of that again in Sunday school today. It's warfare from beginning to end. And, uh, you know, we've, uh, they've thought about, well, uh, in the, in the, particularly in the 60s, in the Vietnam era, there was a group of hippies here and there and everywhere that were saying, uh, uh, love, no war, or peace, no war, anything except warfare. But the, what they don't understand is there is no peace without warfare. There is no love without warfare. Take a simple verse like John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he what? There's no period after that. He gave his only begotten son. What happened at the cross? Warfare of the ages. And so when you think about this whole matter of warfare, we live in a day when we're trying to get rid of that. Can, have you ever heard anything more imbecilic from a biblical base than defunding the police, for instance? In other words, that tells you that whoever is behind that movement has no concept whatsoever what the Word of God teaches. In fact, they're insane, which means they're out of touch with reality. I don't know whether you realize or not, you know that everybody that's unsaved is out of touch with reality because reality is truth. And who is truth? Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. Well, you say, you got to be careful about using that word insane. I thought that means foaming at the mouth. Not necessarily. I meet a lot of people. Listen, some of the people that have been foaming out the mouth, at the mouth have not been troubled to me as people who don't foam at the mouth, but they're full of Satan. 
And some of them are behind pulpits today. Some of them are in seminaries today. You know, we, we, and I know that we're focused a lot on this, on the, uh, on the White House situation, but I'm here to tell you the real problem is with the church house. But, I'm, but I'm, I want to end on a positive note today. Somebody asked, is, is it possible to have revival in America? My answer to that is absolutely. I don't look for a worldwide revival. If you look at prophecy, things are actually getting worse and worse. And, and again, some of us, I think you'll join me in this. Uh, there was a time when my wife and I were, you know, uh, we, we were just simply looking for the upper taker rather than the undertaker. Anybody like that today? But we don't know what God's timing is. I don't know how long this is going to go on, but at, at, the, at the same time, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. And so, Back at the ranch, we need to be faithful to what God has given us because he can move again. And somebody said, you know, the virus may be spreading, but so is the gospel. And it's very, it's very uh, obvious in some quarters that people are being saved as a result of this shutdown and all the rest of it. In other words, God's allowed it to happen for a reason. And if it means an ingathering of souls, then we'll just praise God for that and thank him for what he's doing. But the issue is, I just wanted to spend a few minutes. I'm looking for the clock. I think it's over here, isn't it? Okay. Um, where, did, where did warfare begin? James says war, you have war among you, James 4, 2. The warfare it, it occurs within you. Now, how did that happen? Well, if we go back in, in antiquity, we know that in Ezekiel 28, 15, uh, iniquity was found in Lucifer. It says, you were perfect from the beginning until what? Iniquity was found in thee. Now, we don't need to get theological about it. We know however you want to slice it, God allowed it to happen. But he's not the author of sin. Amen. Lucifer decided what? He's going to be not like God, but he's going to be God. And I thought you might like to just look at this one portion. Uh, Ezekiel 28 gives you a portion, but if you half that, you get... You get 14 and put Isaiah in front of it and you have the two passages about Lucifer or, or the devil. So Isaiah 14, if you want to just take a peek at that, I wanted you to see that in kind of a background of what we're trying to say today. Uh, Ezekiel 14, 12 says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Son of the morning, by the way, is, was his name, is what it means. How art thou cut down to the ground? Thou didst weaken the nations, for thou hast said, notice, hast said in thine heart, didn't say it out loud, um, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne upon the stars of God, I will sit also upon the, uh, the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Gives us some indication of what direction heaven is in. And I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high. And then he said, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. You know, hell was established for the devil and his angels, according to Matthew 24. But here we have the five I wills. Isn't that interesting? I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Isn't that the problem? When you think of sin, what's in the middle? I. I, always. Me, myself, and I. You know, it's significant. Take this in the right way. But you know, it's interesting to me how many people take selfies. <laughs> now, we used to take, we used to, you know, we used to shoot up the countryside or take other, and now, <laughs> and that's one guy. You, before you put that on Facebook, how many times did she said, I, I took about 34 shots. I said, well, what was different? I said, did you remove a zit off your cheek or something? What, I mean, what, what was the difference from, from shot number one to 34, you know? I mean, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to make fun of that. I understand it. And, and thank God you can, I mean, years ago, you'd have to get somebody to take your picture. Now you can do it on your own. But by the same token, it's amazing how we're so caught up with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem, and it's always been a problem. And as a result of that, it wasn't a matter of Lucifer trying to be like God. You know, that is the will of God for you and me, to be like God in a legitimate sense, in a proper way. And the Lord Jesus died to make that so. 
But Lucifer wanted to what? Usurp God's authority. In other words, God, you're not running the show too well. You move over and let me take the throne. And that's basically, you know, as a result of the, the curse of sin, that's built into every human being. Because this whole scenario came out of heaven and ended up in the Garden of Eden. And here's Satan now who couldn't get by with what he did. He kicked out. He approaches the first couple and, and, and tempt Eve to eat the fruit. And with the, with the understanding and, and the lie, by the way, that you could be like God by disobeying God. She fell for that. Adam fell for that. We could get into that. And that's a long, that's a very interesting story. I often wonder just where was he during that time? But the issue is that he ate the fruit and it doesn't say in Eve all die. That's Romanism, by the way. In Adam all die. Even so in Christ shall be all made alive. So the curse comes down to the earth. Every man is born in sin. The first kid born was Cain. And what did he do? He, it, it, you know, I, I've often wondered about it. He didn't steal a cookie out of the cookie jar. I could understand that. He rose up and killed his brother. The first kid born in the world was a murderer. And you see it in children, as lovely as all of them are, you, you understand, you parents, it's interesting, isn't it? One of the first words they, they learn is what? No! And the second word is what? Mine! You know? And you know, and all of us, even at our stage of the game, unless I'm the only one, I still have a problem with that. I hate to admit it, but you know, when they bring out the pizza, I'm still looking for the big piece. You say, well, I'm, I would never do that. Well, then maybe what you do is you look for the next two pieces that equal the same size as the big piece. <laughs> Why is that? It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, we're in a mess because it's me, myself, and I, and only the grace of God changes that. And so now I wanted to uh, zero in a little bit today. Let me uh, check something here. The law came into play after sin, after the curse with Moses. What did the law do? Well, the law was so that we could keep the law and be saved. It never happened. We find out from Romans that the law was actually used of God, not only to manifest his glory, but to show us that we could not keep his commandment, that we were sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So what did the law do? If you're, if you're taking notes, you might want to just look later at uh, Romans 3, 19 and 20. It's a tremendous couple of verses. That the law was given that, all, that every mouth may be stopped. Second, that all the world might become guilty before God. And thirdly, the law was given to show us the exceedingness of sin. In other words, how great sin is. You say, well, what's that got to do with salvation? Well, frankly, unless you, unless you know that you've broken God's law, you'll never be saved. We're living in a day when we're trying to get people saved and they have no idea that they're lost. Some of you are going to x-rays and I've been at the x-ray ward on a, several times now. And you notice people don't smile in the x-ray ward. Why? Because they're getting their picture took. Not only in this case, and it, is, it may be your lungs or your heart, and, it's, and, and, and it may not be a pretty picture, and you're what? You're anticipating maybe a negative on the negative. But what's the purpose of the law? Well, we know from Galatians, the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And I think this is very, because we're hung up in the church today, we're still trying to live under the old covenant along with the new covenant. That's Galatianism. And the church is loaded like that. It's not Christ plus the law. It's Jesus Christ plus minus nothing what he did on the cross. You can't add baptism or church membership or healing or anything else to the gospel. Because when you add to the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ, you take away from the good news. So what does an x-ray do? Well, it's a good illustration of the law. When you take an x-ray, it shows what? It shows there's something wrong. And so if somebody has a shot, on, and some of us had the experience with a, uh, uh, a shadow on the lung, let's say, 
and they put it up to the light and they say, well, listen, uh, this, is, uh, this is cancer. This has got to be taken care of. Now, what does the x-ray do at that point? Nothing. The x-ray is totally useless or helpless at that point. But what did it do? It tells us what the problem is, but thank God there's the great physician over here in the office with his scalpel ready, ready to do something about it. In other words, the law points us to the one who can take care of the malady. And so the x-ray just, God uses the law to show us what our condition is. And then the law was given to Moses, but thank God grace and truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the gospel? Paul tells us it's what has to do with Christ. Died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again from the dead, according to the scriptures. And if you're, you and I are saved today, it's not through baptism or something else. It's the fact when Jesus died, we died with him. When he was buried, we were buried with him. When he got up out of the grave, we got up out of the grave with him. In fact, if you run over to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, it says when he ascended into heaven, we ascended with him and sat down with him in heavenly places. By the way, I'm eventually, if I get, hopefully I can get to it in a few minutes, I want to talk about the war on worry. So with that in mind, if you'll turn to Philippians chapter 4, I better get with it. You say, how does all this, we're talking about all the people that have given their lives and all the warfare of the past. I'd like to get past the warfare. Let me tell you something. As long as you're down here, that'll never happen. But one thing for sure, God declared war on Lucifer. And what did he do? He kicked him out. And when he tempted the first couple, what did God do? In his loving way, he declared war on sin. What do you think the covering was that God put over Adam and Eve? They, now they had, you say they saw they were naked. Well, what did they have on before the clothing? They had the glory of God. For all have sinned and come short of what? The glory of God. They had a glory. Now they tried to cover up with aprons and fig leaves and all. God says, no, I can see right through that. And remember when God began to talk to them, they hid in the bushes. And so the grace of God followed them down. And what did God? God made a covering of skin. And it was one skin in Hebrew, not two. Out of one animal that he killed, he clothed both Adam and Eve. And that's a picture immediately of what? The robe of righteousness that came through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're covered today in that robe. And by the way, if you're saved today, it sets up a whole new warfare, doesn't it? Because now as a Christian, we walk with God, but, but we still have a battle, don't we? Between the flesh and the spirit. Until we what? Until we see Jesus face to face. But the issue is that by the grace of God, we can have victory in the battle. Now, we've opened Philippians 4, and let me just give you a little smattering of what I was going to say today. Um, <coughs> did you know the theme of the book of Philippians is what? Anybody know? The, believe it or not, the theme is joy. Yep. Where was Paul? In, in jail. That helps me right off the bat. <laughs> Paul was a jailbird. I've often wondered how many resumes he sent out to local churches to be a pastor. But the point was he paid a real price because of the transition from the law to grace. And he suffered much, and Jesus forewarned him of all of that. Do you remember when he was converted on the Damascus Road? But he tells them up front in Philippians 4.1, and I wanted you to know this before I go any further. Uh, chapter 1, verse 6. He starts with a promise and he says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. We need to get that settled in our heart in this day. You say, Doc, this is a real day to be alive. Yes, it is. And instead, and we don't want to play mumble pig. We don't want to have a negative attitude because why? We're on the winning side. Right. It may not look that way, but so what? Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And so God's allowed this to happen, and I don't know about you, I want to report for duty. There's something God wants to do in and through us and through this local assembly at Catanic. And he says, I want you to be confident. If God started work, unlike us, he finishes the job. Amen. How many to-do lists do you have at home, you guys? Huh? I don't know about you, I've been, I've been a great starter in a lot of stuff, but somehow it all, it all fizzled out. 
Aren't you glad when God starts something, he continues it and he'll finish the job? And we need to have that etched in our spirit today, okay? So going over to chapter 4 then, skipping over, there's a lot we could say here. There was a problem with a couple of ladies in the church. By the way, their names, they're named in, um, in verse 3, I think it is. Oh, no, excuse me, verse 2. I beseech Eodas and Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. I've often thought people said, boy, if we could just go back to the early church where things were just so smooth and powerful, baloney. <laughs> people haven't changed a lick from then till now. Evidently, these were two, maybe they were choir members at each other's throat. I don't know. Huh? It happens. But he says, I'm praying, I want them to be on, to, to, here's my lingo, here's my translation. I want these two ladies to be on the same page. And if you'd conduct the choir, the choir is not to sing just in unison, it's to sing what? In harmony. And every one of us here is part of that choir. We may not sing verbally, but we're all part of the deal. We're all part of the body of Christ. And I have to throw this in for what it's worth. Some of you know that I walk like a drunk because of the neuropathy on the bottom of my feet through the cancer that I've had for the last five years. So when you see me in, when you see me in front of the mission in Youngstown, you can't tell who's who. But I've just, I've just come to realize that I can feel my toes, my little, my toes in a way that I couldn't feel them two years ago. And I can actually stand up in the shower without holding onto the bar, the bar on the wall I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I noticed, and I thought to myself, thank God for little toes. Some of you here are little toes and you don't know it. I'm here to tell you whatever, if you, if, you, if you forget everything else I've said, you're somebody in God. There's room, listen, the body of Christ, every part of that body is important. There's some people like to be, you know, wave and be a tongue and be a big shot. Listen, without the little toes, they'd fall on their face. Huh? You'd be the best. By the way, our brother was talking about the... Um, dealing with the Philistines, is it true that when they, um, they dealt with these kings they, or the giants, they cut off the, the, the big toe and what, and the thumb? You ever try to operate without a big toe and a big, th and a thumb? Wow. In other words, they, dis they disabled them. Everything is important. Your ministry is important. It's just as sacred to, to swish that toilet bowl, you know, that, that brush around the toilet bowl as it is to make a dinner, or frankly, to preach out of the pulpit. It all works together for the glory of God. Amen. And revival, what revival does, everybody gets in their niche. Somebody said, we need a, we need a, a chiropractic treatment on the body of Christ. There's too many subluxations, you know the term? In other words, there's square pegs and round holes. And when God comes on the scene, the, 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 the pegs and the, and the hole line up properly. Some people get out of the pulpit, other people get in the pulpit, or whatever the case may be. In other words, and, we, and, and listen, I believe that's what God's going to be doing these days. No, America may not fall on its face, but I believe there are pockets of grace like Grace Baptist Church around the country that God's reviving and refreshing and renewing. And I'll tell you, it's time to shout for Jesus. It really is. Amen. I'll tell you, you know, some of you may need to stumble. Like a lady in my church years ago, she said, Pastor, I sit there and I want to say, praise the Lord. And I, I said, well, why don't she said, well, everybody will look at me. <laughs> and I said, well, look, help yourself. I said, I, I you know, I said, I, I, I know this, this is, uh, you know, you, you can get by with this in a Baptist church. You know. <laughs> th th this, this is Pentecostal. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, she was Pentecostal. <laughs> she got liberated. And you know what? It, it caught on. Not that we made a circus out of the house. But people, listen, they shout at the ball game. Why don't we, this is really something to shout about. Huh? Okay. So in chapter 4 of Philippians, let me just drop in with verse 4. There's three Ps I want to give you as I close. In verse 4, verse 5, you can put the word praise. 
Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation or gentleness be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Verse 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplications. That's the second P. We go from praise to prayer. And verse 7, what's the word? And the peace of God. So if I don't get through the message today, at least you got the three Ps. And it's in that order, by the way. The scripture says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5.16, rejoice evermore. How do you do that? Hear all the prayer requests today? And some of you didn't say anything, but you're, you were hurting too. You know what? I'm glad the church is not a courtroom, but it's a hospital. We all need help, don't we? we all, we're all hurting one way or another. But isn't it amazing how we can rejoice in the Lord despite that? Now, what's the difference between happiness and joy? Well, happiness is always dependent on what's happening. If nothing's happening, I ain't happy. <laughs> but joy's got nothing to do with that. I don't know, there have been times when I wasn't happy, but I could sit at the edge of the bed and say, thank you, Lord, for peace and joy that passes understanding. Why? Because it was the gift of the Holy Spirit. I don't know whether you thought about this. If you're, if you're unsaved, you're not, you're not a believer. When you hurt, you hurt all over, head to toe. But you can be saved by the grace of God and have a toe ache, a heartache, a, a backache, and have the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. Amen? Amen. Because it's got nothing to do. So let me, let me give this statement. If you're taking notes, this is a pretty good statement. Only a real believer, a spirit-filled believer, can be miserable and happy at the same time. <laughs> let me say that again. Only a believer can be miserable and happy at the same time. You can have joy in cancer. It's a battle. And I'm not going to stand here and say that it was just a piece of cake. I, God took me down. But how to win the battle over fear and worry. And let me just expound a little bit here on these verses. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The Williams translation says, keep up the glad spirit. And again, I say, keep up the glad spirit. How do you do that? because it's God in you. The spirit of joy lives in us. The love, the joy, the peace, the what? The long, long suffering. And the gentleness and the goodness and all the rest of it, it's a gift from God, no matter what our situation may be. Whether you're 16 or 68, doesn't make any difference. So Paul could call, Paul could recommend that and say, I'm experiencing this even though I'm in prison and I'm separated from you. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The word moderation means gentleness. And I want to say something here. I hear a lot of people talk about the grace of God, the grace of God, and I'm a grace man, and, I'm a, and you're a grace man. But I'll tell you what, I've been very disillusioned sometimes with grace men, and I'm thinking of preachers primarily. Nobody here. I'm just, just making a general statement. Preachers who preach grace who are not gracious. So it would seem to me, if you believe in grace, that you would be a gracious, humble individual. That makes sense? I think it makes sense. That's why I'm glad the scripture says, you know, he says that we should love one another, but he didn't, he didn't tell us to like everybody. That might help somebody. Boy, it helped me when I heard that. Because I thought as a Christian, I just have to hang out. With, I have to love people just and, and do it. And, and I found myself in bondage. It dawned on me that I can love somebody and want God's best for their life, but I don't want to hang out with them. The Lord is at hand. You ever think about that? I've been thinking a lot about it, especially since I got a citation about three weeks ago on Route 711, going down Route 11 on Ohio. I didn't see the police anywhere. <laughs> you know what happened. 
I've been tempted to, I've been tempted to put masking tape over my license plate. <laughs> they got me. The Lord was at hand. <laughs> Did you know that we're under constant surveillance? Yes. There's nothing that escapes him. By the way, that can be a good thing, can it? You know, a couple of times, and only a couple of times, I went down the highway and Smokey was over here up on the hill, you know. And boy, I got near that car and my foot came up off the accelerator. And would you know, I was going about 54 in a 55 mile an hour play. So I rode by the... <laughs> you know, it was wonderful. It was wonderful getting caught doing right. <laughs> Instant replay. It's amazing, isn't it? Instant replay. Be anxious for nothing. Verse 6. This is a war on anxiety. Anxiety. It's another word for worry. And we could spend a lot of time here. Prayer and worry don't mix. You ever try to pray and worry at the same time? It doesn't work. By the way, have you ever tried to hate somebody and pray for them? It doesn't work. So God has given us, he, in, in commandment here, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer. So the issue must be, if you're not going to worry about anything, we need to pray about everything. And Jesus is what? The same yesterday, today, and forever. And when you go back to David, and I was going to go to, um, you might want to jot down Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. And he goes on three verses of praise. And then he gets to the fourth verse. And he says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Worry is fear, isn't it? It can get you. You say, well, Doc, what does that have to do with all, the, all that's going on today with Russia and China and the White House and all the, the, uh, the economic straits that were, it's got everything to do with it. I'm here to tell you that God's got his own economy. This is the day that he's made. And we don't need, and, and you see, here's the thing. <clears throat> we can get all caught up in the politics of the thing and lose our joy in the Lord and be filled with worry. The point is, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little things that be, get between us and God, huh? We're so worried about which way America is going. Well, what about my own heart? What about my own life, my own family? And so we need to what? Focus in worry, you see? And I've been reminded of the little birds out, out our kitchen window. You know, I, I fill that feeder up with seed and it seems like they wink at me or something. You know, they, they say, we'll be back tomorrow. And they never, get, they never seem to worry about anything. How we need to love God and trust him that way. He'll never leave us, nor forsake us, no matter what. And here, I want to share this with you. That's something that struck me this week. If, if you're in a situation, whatever that is, then God allowed it for a purpose. Can I say that again? For instance, when I, was, when I was diagnosed with a cancer, I want to tell you what, I didn't handle it too well up front. I lost sight of what I'm telling you right now. I'm just telling you. It took me a little while to get my act together. I didn't jump up. I went, well, did you jump up? Hallelujah, go over to Jesus. No, I don't think so. I was devastated until I got my bearings and I realized that God even had a reason for the cancer. He's an all-loving father. He's not going to let anything undertake for us without a purpose. Listen, you and I are saved on purpose for a purpose. We're not taking up space here. I mean, God could have saved us and changed us on a moment and took us right to heaven. That would have been nice, wouldn't it? But instead, he left us here in this cruel, wicked, dark world to what? To be a light so that other people can come in. And sometimes somebody's got to see somebody who's victorious, even in the midst of cancer 
or some other problem. And so with that in mind, when you go to the x-ray ward, you say, Lord, it's all going to, because you're at hand, it's all, you're, all things, all things are working together for good. Not to everybody, but to those who, want, who love God and to those who are what called according to his purpose. Now, some of you bakers, I know we have bakers here, I'm sure. And you get that, all that, that flour and, and, the, and uh, the vanilla and the egg white and all the other stuff. And, when you, and, and, and if you went in the kitchen and somebody came in and sh scooped that out, you'd probably throw up. But when you whip all that stuff together somehow with the proper ingredients and put it in the oven in that cake pan and at the right temp and turn that thing out and put some whipped cream on it, man, oh man, isn't it wonderful how all that stuff works together for good. Our God's in charge, amen. Our God reigns. He reigns. Satan doesn't reign. But God's allowed him to be around for, and God's using him to test us and to make us what we want to be because God's got a ministry for us. I can't tell you since I've had the cancer, the doors and the things that God has done in my life and through my life. I, we don't have time to talk about it, but I, I, just, I, I just want to take a moment to praise him for that. And I'm an old duck and you would think, well, duck, when are you going to just collapse? I have no idea. I know one thing, though, I want to die with my boots on, if that's possible. I'd like to die with my boots on, if you know what I mean by that. What a great God. What a great God we serve. And I'm excited about you guys as I pray for you and I just see what the Lord's doing and, and bringing, you know, the past, all the ministry here in the past, all of it starts to mushroom. You know, you sow the seed. When the farmer sows the seed, he doesn't sit on the front porch and say, well, I'm expecting the corn tomorrow. It doesn't work that way, does it? You sow that and plow that seed, and you have to wait, but the harvest is coming, and it's in God's timing. And in the meantime, we, are not, we need to not to endure the Lord. We need to enjoy the Lord forever. That, isn't that what the catechism says? What's the, what's the chief end of man? To glorify God and to endure him forever. That's not what it says. We need to enjoy the Lord, even through the tears. And people say, well, how are you handle it without your wife? I rejoice through the tears. Huh? And one day, by the grace of God, there's going to be a glad reunion but in the meantime, back at the ranch, we've got a job to do. God's given us because there's many more that need what you and I have from the B-I-B-L-E. Okay? So, once more, once more, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication, supply, with thanksgiving. Huh? Let your request be made known unto God. What's Thanksgiving? Can I take a minute? How many have ever seen on a church sign, Holy Eucharist? Have you ever seen that sign, Holy Eucharist, 930, Sunday morning? I used to look at it and I said, that, that word gave me the willies. And I found out later it was a Greek word after I studied a little Greek. <coughs> Eucharist, the, the word charis is in there, or the word charis, from which we get gift or charismatic. The word EU is the word for well. Well charismatic, well gifted. How many of you know what a euphonium is? Come on. Euphonium, that used to be a, what, like a, like a baritone horn or something like that? And they call it a euphonium. What does it mean? Do you know what a euphonium? The word phonos is the word for sound, and EU is well. So if you play a euphonia, you better sound well. <laughs> but it's that, little, it's that little EU that's on the word charis. It means to be well graced. And if you change the I after graced, the I to A, kara is the word for joy. Do you know what, do you know, so you know how it's translated? Thanksgiving. In other words, in other words, Somebody who's thankful is full of grace and full of joy. Belly achers are never thankful. 
And so what? Listen, in this hour, how about if we just brighten the corner where we are? That's all we can do. Reflect his light. Somebody said, Doc, what does it mean to, what does it mean to live to the glory of God? What does that mean, that glory? Well, it mean, that's majesty and heaviness of the Spirit of God in our, but how do we glorify Christ? And somebody put it this way, I like it. It's that we live in such a way that everything we do makes Jesus Christ look great. I like that definition. In other words, when pe this world's watching, hey, they're watching. They need someone, don't they? They need the Savior we're talking about. And we just need to be re good reflectors of that heavenly light that everything we do in our personal lives makes him look great. And I like to tie in with that when somebody, Jesus said, uh, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. What does that mean? How do you be, how do you a fisher of men? Are you the pole? Are you the, are you the line? Are you the hook? I don't think we're any of that. I think we're the, we're the night crawler at the end of the hook wiggling for Jesus. And revival, you know, I don't know about you, but fish, I think, I don't think, you fishermen, you know, fish do not like dead worms. This world needs to something, see something other than a dead worm. They need to see a live, spirit-filled believer wiggling for the Lord Jesus Christ and let people know that we're on the winning side, even though it looks sometimes like we're losing. And somebody reminded me today, and I'll remind you again. Years ago in New Jersey, when I was pastoring there, a fellow was visiting from Virginia and uh, he met me at the back door, had his Bible under his arm, and he said, Pastor Finnegan, he said, uh, you look a little down today. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm having a rough time, by the way. Now, I could have said, you know, well, hallelujah, I'm, I'm fine. You know, I could, have done, I could have done that routine. I said, yeah, yeah, I'm a little discouraged today for some reason. And he pulled that sword out from under his arms. He said, I just wanted you to know, I've read the last chapter of this book, we win. Huh? We win. And I lived close to Philly in those days. Did you know there's a, there's a Bible, there's a bookstore in Philly called Who Done It? I guess they carry a whole store with murder mysteries and what have you. I've never been a real mystery buff, but I'll tell you what, this book is a mystery. There's a lot of mysteries in this book. And I thought, how would I handle a murder mystery? I know a lot of people that labor through and they're always wondering who done it. But I'll tell you what, I would, I would probably pick up one of those books. I'd get the plot and the characters, read a couple chapters, and then I would go to the last chapter <laughs> and find out who done it. You say that would spoil it. Now for me, it wouldn't. <laughs> Somebody said, well, look, you're, you know, you're spoiling. And while you're reading through the whole deal, I already know who done it. The butler didn't do it. Amen. Thank God I know who's done it, who's going to do it. Let's praise him together. Will you bow with me in prayer? You got the worries today and the fear? Why don't you drop it at the foot of the cross? You know, worry is sin, really. He that knoweth to do good, doeth it not to him, it is sin. And you might just want to cry out to God today as we close. Lord, I'm coming with my worries and my burdens. Peter put it this way. We we're going to read something from him. He said, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Thank God someone cares for us when nobody else cares. I'm telling you, sometimes in the loneliness of the day, I wonder, especially when your companion is not anywhere around, thank God there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. We need him. So drop whatever it is on at the foot of the cross. It's not worth it. And let him fill your heart with his peace and his joy in the midst of that circumstance. Let's just take a moment.
Thank you, Father, for the peace that comes when we drop everything at your feet. That we don't need to be anxious. We can praise you. We can, we can open our hearts in prayer and fellowship with you. And then you said the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Lord, make that real in hearts today. It's so easy to look around and see all the turmoil in the world, all the wickedness and the darkness, but oh God, brighten us in our hearts today. Thank you that greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. And so Father, we worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you for forgiving grace. Forgive us, Lord, where we've missed it with you. You said if we confess our sin, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we praise you. We thank you for what you're going to do, even in this, continuing in this local assembly, pastor and people, and we thank you for each one here who's part of your body. And Lord, I just pray that there'll be a reviving grace, uh, uh, an, an igniting of the flame of the Holy Spirit in Catanning, Pennsylvania. And we're going to just thank you and praise you for everything that transpires. We give you all the thanks in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.